Carl, as we start out, do, uh, do we have any guests or new members to greet? Um, no new members, four possible guests. Um, I do not see any of them on uh, Zoom as of yet. And David just texted me and says, we've got six souls in the room. Okay. Well, well technically, well, technically there are 12 souls in the room if you're counting feet. I was just about to say that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is where I, where yes. <laughs> you're very funny. <laughs> Thank you very much. What about yeah. online souls? Brothers. Uh, there's online souls. <sighs> Carol, do you want to talk a little bit about the upcoming competition? Uh, we're having a competition. Well, thank you for that. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, August 23rd, that would be blue and golden hour. Uh, and there was uh, in our newsletter, in the August newsletter, I'm assuming everybody read it already. Um, I had uh, links to a couple of tutorials on YouTube that I thought were very good about um, shooting in blue hour, golden hour, and um, what equipment you might need, exposures and that kind of stuff, and subject matter, and how to maximize uh, getting good results. And of course, on the 30th, we have uh, our outing with David um, and down to downtown Littleton for a photo shoot, gonna get together for a couple hours and shoot down there and then go head to a restaurant and have a little food and drink and camaraderie. And I invite everybody to show up for that. Um, again, that was mentioned in the newsletter too. It's also in the calendar on the website. And if you are planning on attending, please make sure that you email David and let him know that you're gonna be there. So he's got a good head count. I think that's all I want to talk about right now. Okay. All right. Um, have any of the uh, guests popped on? I do not see. Let's see. We got... No, I don't see any. Sorry. Okay. Well, let's uh, just keep rolling. Um, those of you who were with the club last year uh, probably saw Rick's uh, presentation on architecture photography. And um, you saw on that him talking about composition and how to set the camera up. And uh, you also saw the amazing pictures that uh, he was able to do and the sharpness he was able to shoot with his techniques. And uh, so today we're looking at the other side of his art, that is his editing, uh, how how he uh, makes those pictures pop that, you know, come out of the camera and raw and might not quite look like uh, what he remembered uh, and how he makes them look amazing. So uh, you'll find that he is... Uh, quite intellectual in his approach to photography. He's, uh, he's constantly thinking about science and how it applies and whatnot. So I think he has a very interesting take as well as he has lots of uh, practical techniques that uh, really do take uh, a picture from raw to polished. <clears throat> Let me just tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Rick's photography is informed from his background as a professional architect and urban designer. He is a life member of the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts and a fellow of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. Rick Holbert is a teacher of photography at Simon Fraser University in Ligaria, Langara College in Vancouver, Washington, excuse me, Vancouver, Canada. Almost uh, made you an um, uh, okay, you're a citizen there. That's Sorry. okay. <laughs> and in more normal times, leads uh, multi day photo workshops throughout Europe and North America. He was one of only two photographers invited to attend and display his fine art images at the World Art Games held in Bratislava, 
Slovakia. And with that, I will turn the, uh, uh, well, let me just say that uh, if you do have questions as we're moving along, uh, please put them in the chat. Carl is going to be monitoring that and deciding when to break in with those questions or at, uh, at the end. We're also planning to take a break about halfway through. And uh, at that time, perhaps uh, he'll answer a few questions for those who want to stay on. Uh, but th the rest of us uh, are free to take a quick break uh, for five minutes. OK, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rick Colbert. And I'm very excited about uh, listening to your program tonight. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. I. Uh... I really want to start off by bringing greetings from Vancouver, Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank Terry for his kind invitation to present to you this evening. I think at, at some point in my last presentation to you folks, I had indicated that if there was an interest in my editing workflow, I'd be happy to come back. And Terry took me up on that. Um, but uh, given the relatively short window of time <clears throat> I have been allocated, <clears throat> to present what is a rather vast topic. Uh, Terry gave me some guidance on what you might like me to communicate it and, and invited uh, and actually invited you to submit your unedited images to me. <clears throat> I, I received a total of three images from Terry, two of wildlife scenes and one I would refer to as portraiture in a natural forest setting. The great thing about photography is that uh, there are actually no universally accepted rules of anything. And uh, that includes the processing and procedures involved in image editing, which, uh, which you might imagine makes it challenging to teach, OK? The, uh, uh, I guess, ultimately, I believe the, the best way to learn is to get in front of photographers who are willing to share their approaches, combining a bit of theory along with a few real world examples. And that's what I'm gonna to do tonight. So with that in mind, I'm gonna start off with a brief explanation of my approach to image editing, followed by five or six example image edits, including two of my own personal raw data files. So I am going to share my screen. So hopefully you can see that guys, let me know if you can't from raw to polished. So. My approach to, I guess, thinking about image editing is to actually do that thinking prior to clicking the shutter. And, and my objective is to, as I put down here, I'm mining for data. Um, and I'll explain, I'll explain what I mean by that. My, my suggestion and my approach is to mention that image editing actually starts in your mind and in your camera. And um, if I'm mining for data, I want to maximize the data that I capture. Uh, data is carried by light, OK? The more light, the more data. So that's how we're going to that's how we're going to kind of look at this. And in order to maximize the amount of light, I want you to learn to rely on your RGB histogram. Now, there's a luminance histogram and an RGB histogram. I'm talking about the colored histogram, OK? Because it's more accurate. Uh, and we want accuracy because what we're going to talk about is how we can capture as much light as possible without overexposing anything. Okay. Um, and when I say not overexposing anything, if you're if you're trying to photograph the surface of the sun with a regular camera, or you're looking at a specular highlight on Chrome, you're not going to be able to eliminate highlights. Okay, that that are clipped. But um, the term that's used is ETTR, which means exposed to the right. Uh, and as I say here, avoid clipping scene highlights. So you have a couple of choices, actually you have more than two, but let's just basically look at the fact that you could shoot in JPEG format, or you could shoot in a RAW format, depending on your camera. Actually, <clears throat> every camera shoots in RAW, but not every camera will allow you to spit out that RAW file before the camera goes ahead and converts it to a JPEG, which effectively bakes in all the data. And when I say all the data, a JPEG image file has 256 tonal values per channel. 
Don't get confused by the fancy talk. There's red, green, and blue. That's why they say RGB. So uh, there's, a, there's a finite number of tonal values that the sensor can record if it's, if it's a digital sensor, okay? Um, uh, however, if you shoot in RAW, depending on if you're shooting a 12-bit 12 12 RAW file or a 14-bit RAW file, you'll get either 4,000 tonal values per uh, channel or 16,000 tonal values per channel. What that adds up to is that a RAW file has, has either 15 times as much data as a JPEG file or 60 times more data than a JPEG. Now I've had people say to me, yeah, but Rick, I look at, I look at uh, uh, these different files and I can't see a difference, especially between a 12-bit uh, raw file and a 14-bit raw file. Well, you know, you're right. I can't tell the difference either, but it's not what it looks like. It's the data that it contains. It's the flexibility that you get when you're editing an image. In the end, you can convert it back to a JPEG. Okay, so to maximize the dynamic range of light recorded, meaning I, I happen to like photographing high dynamic range scenes, meaning uh, there's shadows and there's uh, highlights. Uh, and I wanna see it all. My eyes can see it. My brain is telling me I can see all of it because, because it's sequential. I don't wanna get too much detail here in, in uh, human uh, vision and the neuroscience of human vision, but the fact is, is that our brain is stitching together uh, a whole lot of views all at once. And that's why it looks like we can see in the shadows and we can see uh, in the highlights in a, in a scene out, out, you know, uh, in real life. Um, so this, the, the thing I want you to also think about, if you want to try to take an example of this picture, which of course is muted here, but we're looking outdoors and we see a gentleman standing inside and we're, we're looking out at, at, at the sky and the clouds. Uh, ideally, you would record using your native base ISO, which is the sensitivity of the sensor, right? And uh, that, what does that mean? It means it's around 100. It might be 64. It might be 200, but it's in that range, okay? Doesn't mean you can't raise the ISO especially if you're looking at a moving image, right? You wanna, you've got to stop the action. I understand that. But if you have a choice, um, you would want to maintain that. So this is an example. This is a, this is a finished photograph in, in Toronto, Canada. And um, there's, a, there's a high dynamic range here. We've got the light bouncing off the bricks. We've got, we've got the, the kind of cloud and mist and uh, smoke in the sky. And we've got uh, shadows uh, and detail in the darker areas. Okay, that's not how it started, right? It started like this. That's what I saw on the back of my camera. And the reason I'm showing you this one example is that it's a mistake to make a decision on your image based on what you see on the back of the camera. It'd be better to look at the histogram, okay? That's, that's what we want, what you're looking at right now. Okay. Briefly, on a histogram, these I, I call these uh, diagrams of the data on a histogram mountains. Just an expression, right? Um, those two mountains are the same, but they're in different positions, you see? The mountain on the left is leaving a good part of the right-hand side of the histogram empty. The mountain on the right is the same one. It's just recorded more brightly, but there's no clipped highlights. How do I know that? Because if you can you see my arrow here, I'm going to come down to the bottom of the mountain range. It does not climb the edge. If it's climbing the edge of the histogram, if this diagram, if this graph is climbing the edge of the histogram, <clears throat> it means that you're clipping highlights, which are generally not recoverable. Okay. So quickly, here's a 12-bit J, J uh, raw file. I want to tell you something that's important. It's broken into five sections here. One, two, three, four, five. The brightest 20% of an image has half of all the data in the picture. With each 20% reduction, you cut the amount of light 
or the amount of data by 50%. So it's going from 50% to 25% to 12.5%. By the time you get down to the darkest 20% of the scene, over here where my arrow is, there's only 3.5% of the data. That's why, that's why there's noise in the shadows. Um, even in, in a 14-bit raw file, now there's this 16,000 tonal values. I'll tell you a little secret. The only place I look at in a histogram is the right-hand corner. You can ignore all the rest. I know that sounds bold. You can ignore the rest. All I want to do is get this, the base of the histogram, the base of the mountain range, right as close to the edge as possible without starting to climb the right-hand side. Okay? That's my first message. Look at it, a JPEG file, same thing, except now there's only eight tonal values down here. Like, this is why there's something called banding in JPEG images. When you're trying to have, for instance, a, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a blue sky and it's going from light blue to dark blue and you want an oh, ever so gentle transition and you end up with these bands of light blue, medium blue, dark blue. I'm exaggerating to make the point. Um, to avoid that, you, sh you, you, you photograph in, in raw. It's my suggestion. So that's my introduction. Now I'm going to start doing some image editing. This is going to be very basic, but it applies to the most complex image you can imagine. Okay. Um, ah, I took a deep breath, <laughs> which I actually always have to do when I start editing because it's a journey. Uh, it doesn't always go as smoothly as you'd like. Now I'm going to use Lightroom Classic because most people that I've encountered in camera clubs and in workshops are using Lightroom Classic. But what I'm going to show you can be done on almost every uh, editing uh, software package. So don't assume you have to have Lightroom. Okay. Um, and I'm going to start, I'm going to start over here actually with this scene. I'm going to start with a landscape scene. Then I'm going to show you an architectural scene. Then I'm going to show you your scenes, a couple of wildlife pictures and an urban uh, or, a, or a, I guess, a casual portrait picture of a human. OK, so uh, here's here's what I do. I'm, I'm in the develop module and um, I have reorganized my palettes here. They come from the factory in a different order. It doesn't really matter the order you use it, but I'm just showing you what uh, I'm doing now. This is being recorded, so you'll be able to take a closer look at it. If you want to take a screen capture of anything, fine. It's okay with me. Um, but I'm going to take you through this. Uh, I'm not going to use everything that's available, but I'm going to show you what I do. Okay? So I'm going to start with lens corrections. Under lens corrections, there are two boxes you can check. You can remove chromatic aberration, and you can enable profile corrections. I always click on these two. I could go hunting for chromatic aberrations. Uh, this, this actually works quite well. So click, click. Now, I also want to tell you, look at the second one, enable profile corrections. See how the image changed kind of its geometry? That's before. Here comes after, three, two, one, click. Um, yeah, I just always click on them. And I trust them because we can always change it later. We can always come back and manage that. At, at a later time. Then I'm going to go to the transform panel. Um, the, the horizon on this uh, image looks like it's a little bit um, not level. Like it looks like it's leaning down to the left a tiny bit. So I'm going to go to the rotate tool and I'm going to just kind of pull it up a little bit. There's so many tools you can, there's so many ways to do this. I'm just going to show you what I would do on this picture. I also noticed that the trees on the right and the trees on the left are kind of leaning in. I'm going to go to the vertical slider, and I'm just going to tweak them a little bit so they're more standing straight up. Is it exactly straight? I don't know. It's close enough. In, architect in the architecture world, <laughs> we would say it's close enough for government work. That's, that's kind of an inside joke. But the point is, whatever looks good to you is correct. All right? That's important to understand. Then I'm going to go to the basic panel. By the way, on the uh, on the uh, transform panel, 
we change the shape of the image. You see that I'm gonna pull back on the scale tool. Uh, I'm gonna leave it like that for now. There are different ways to fill that in. I'm gonna show you that later. Uh, I could, uh, in other words, I could crop it, right? Boom, it's done. Except if I wanna to try to get a little more space between this tree trunk and the edge of the image, um, I, and I'll show you, I'll go backwards. I might wanna just leave it like this for now. I'm gonna make that decision later, but hang with me. I'm gonna to go to the basic panel. 90% of the work gets done in the basic panel. Maybe I should have said 90% of the joy of editing, okay? Um, I rarely change the exposure slider. I do, I will if I need to. Uh, I almost never use the contrast slider because I'm gonna show you other ways that I use that I use contrast. I generally start with highlights and shadows. So I'm gonna take the highlight slider and pull it down. By the way, let's go back for a second. Here's Look at this histogram. This is a thing of beauty. <laughs> uh, I know that sounds arrogant, but you see the histogram, oh, it doesn't start climbing the right. Could be a little bit brighter. We'll deal with that. And it's coming pretty close down and not clipping the shadows. If you clip a little bit of shadows, it's not so bad. But uh, just a thought to begin with, I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna bring the highlights down and I'm gonna bring the shadows up. So here's before. Here's after. I'm, I'm liking this better. Some of you may say, well, you know, why did you do that, Rick? Because now you've got extra space here in the highlights. Well, I'm going to use that. I'll tell you how I'm going to use that. I'm not going to deal with whites and blacks. A lot of people start with that. I think that's a mistake. Uh, and and um, to me, whites and blacks is like salt and pepper. In, in I'm gonna have a bowl of soup. If I'm gonna add salt or pepper, I'm gonna do it just before I eat it, at the end of the cooking process, not at the beginning. Now, I'm obviously not a cook, but I'm just trying to give you an analogy, all right? I'm gonna deal with contrast. Most of the sliders in Lightroom are contrast, but if they called them all contrast, it would be even more confusing than it is now, okay? So I'm gonna deal with what they call presence, not like Christmas. This is just presence, okay, with an S, okay? So texture, clarity, and dehaze. Texture is fine grain, a little more fine grain. I'm gonna pull that up. I'm gonna pull up clarity, and I'm gonna pull up dehaze. Now, see what I did? Pretty much a stair step. First step, second step, third step. That's what I call a stair step, okay? Now, that happens quite often. I would say 95% of the images that I play with end up that way. So it's not a rule. Eh, there are no rules, right? Um, I'm, I'm telling you what I have learned and what I've experienced. So um, generally, you don't want to do too far, go too far on dehaze. See, dehaze, dehaze, if you pull it all the way to the right or all the way to the left, you can destroy an image, OK? Um, uh, clarity also is pretty powerful. Texture depends. If it was my wife, I'd be moving it more to the left. Okay, you get my drift. If it's now, I'm gonna. I, I want to. I want to get more detail. I want to get more detail. Let me see if I can zoom in here on the on the uh, leaves of the trees. That's before. That's after. Okay. Now I'm gonna pull back. And the next thing I'm gonna do is deal with, with um, I'm not gonna to touch vibrance or saturation. Whoa, why? Because I play with color in the calibration panel. The panel that used to be separate and people like me would write in and say, that's very important. Why are you leaving it at the very end? Nobody uses it. I'll tell you why it's important because not only will it allow me to look at saturation and even hue, which I don't usually play with hue, but I can play with saturation in each of the three uh, uh, RGB uh, sections of the picture. So I can take the red slider and don't be afraid to do what I'm gonna do. Go all the way to the right, all the way to the left. Uh, just take a look and then work backwards. Well, I don't see a huge benefit. I'm gonna come up a tiny bit with the red slider, with the green slider. You know, I'm gonna come up just a little bit with the green slider. And with the blue slider, whoa, 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 big differences here. Tell you what, I'm gonna pull the blue slider up more. 
you can go up to 100, I'm gonna go up like 50 or so, give or take. Don't worry about the numbers, it's like about halfway. You can just look at it and see what I mean when I say halfway from zero to wherever you wanna go. Okay, now the next thing I'm gonna look at, so I've done color, I've done tone, that was, the, that was the highlights and shadows. I've done color. Now I'm gonna look at uh, luminance, which I guess is also tone. Uh, it, luminance is hard to see in color. Black and white is pure luminance, all right? Uh, if, you, if you think of a black and white image, that's what luminance is. But there's luminance in color. It's just not easy to tell. So what I do is I take each of these colors and I believe it or not, I'm just gonna pull it all the way to the right, all the way to the left. I don't see any reason to play with red. I'm gonna take the orange slider, I'm gonna pull it, I'm gonna pull it up, pull it down. Whoa, look at the lower left hand side of the picture. See, it's making a difference there. I'm gonna pull it up. Now yellow. Whoa, God, it's too much. Yellow, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna leave yellow where it is, okay? Uh, green. Uh, I'm gonna actually bring green down a touch. And this is all. This is something you just got to try and do what you like. I, I, I've said that before. All that matters in photography. And, and, and I'm a teacher, okay? Okay? <laughs> it's not what judges say. We all see color differently. It's what you like, what you enjoy, especially if you want to become a famous photographer or if you want to do fine art photography. It, all that matters is what you personally enjoy. Uh, aqua. Look at that aqua slider. I see almost nothing, I'm gonna leave it. Blue, whoa, 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 big difference there, eh? Let's pull blue down. That's looking really good. And purple, uh, I don't see enough to make a difference. Magenta, all the way to the right, all the way to the left, don't see much of a difference. I'm gonna leave it there. So that's, that's, uh, the, that's where we are now. I'm happy with that. Not going to play with the tone curve because we've basically done everything a tone curve does right now, pretty much. I know some of you may argue with that, but the tone curve is a great tool. It's not always necessary. Detail, though, detail basically is is uh, is contrast, but it's it's edge contrast. That's what sharpening edge. It's sharp, sharpening the edges of objects and elements. So I'm gonna I can be quite aggressive with with the uh, with the sharpening tool. Uh, because what I have in Lightroom and other programs have, I believe as well, this masking slider. This is very powerful, all right? If I hold down the Option key on a Mac or the Alt key on Windows, hold them both down together, when it's white, it means it's sharpened. Now, everything is sharpened. Well, we don't want to sharpen the sky, so I want to make the sky black. Actually, I don't want to sharpen everything in the picture. I just want to sharpen the edges of the leaves and the, and the uh, branches. So I'm pulling it all the way. I'm making it look like it's a negative instead of a positive. Remember film days? Some of you guys will remember that, right? So let go. That's the final image, except for deciding whether I crop it or fill some of this area in. I'm gonna wait on that for now. And all I'm gonna do on this picture is I'm going to save it now we're gonna to go to another image. We're gonna do some architecture, all right? The opposite of nature, okay? Designed and constructed. So look at this scene. This is also a high contrast scene. I've got lights, this is indoors, right? Indoor, this is a, uh, a student union building in, in, uh, in, at a university uh, that, I've, that I've taught at. And it's a great building. I did not design it, it's, but it's a fantastic building. Light streaming through the windows, but look at it's so bright outside that that there's look at the look at the histogram. The high there's a lot of highlights blown here, and meaning unrecoverable, and there's a lot of cliff shadows, meaning I'm not gonna even be able to draw information out of the shadows. So it's like I don't want this picture. It's not gonna work for me. I want one that is only as bright as possible without overexposing. So here's the histogram of the picture that is as bright as possible, almost touching, but not quite. This is two stops darker than the original picture I showed you. Then I've got one, a second one. So the, okay, the first one, 
one picture as bright as possible without any clipped highlights, except if the sun was in the picture, right? Okay, the second picture I want is a picture that's so much brighter than the first. This is four stops brighter than that first one I showed you. It's so much brighter than the first that while there's a lot of clipped highlights, there's no clip shadows. Hmm. Hmm. I want those two images. Those are the only two I'm going to use. Um, these are four stops apart. I've done it as far as six stops apart. Uh, if I was going to be nine stops apart or eight stops apart, I'll probably put in a third one in the middle. Okay. But that's not typical because this is a super contrasting scene. You'll see in a moment. I'm going to take these two images, uh, click on them both, and I'm going to go up here to the top to photo. I'm going to go to photo merge, and I'm going to merge to HDR. And it's going to do its job here. Now I have the potential for doing things here. I'm clicking on auto align because if the camera moved, I, I don't want that. I want both pictures aligned exactly. Um, and I can get it to show low, medium, and high areas if if uh, if there's a movement in the picture, all right? So um, there's really none, all, or very little uh, on this picture. And if there is, it will take care of it. It will deal with it. But I'm gonna merge them now. And I'm showing you this as it really happens, so you can see how long it takes. Here at the, at the bar on the left, on the upper right, uh, sorry, the upper left, it's moving when it gets to the X, when it gets to the end, it means that it will be done. Okay, so now people look at this and say, well, big deal, it's not that good. Well, this is a this is a 16-bit uh, floating point TIFF. Now that is about as geeky as you can get in describing an image. Let me explain why it's so powerful. Remember how I was talking about raw files or JPEG files having uh, uh, the most detail in the brightest part of the picture? 50% uh, of all the data in the brightest 20% of the picture. And in reverse, by the time you get down to the darkest part, three and a half percent of the data. Um, in a floating point TIFF file, uh, it's no longer a raw file, but, but the data is evenly distributed. That's amazing. Don't ask me how it, don't ask me how they do it. Like, I don't really understand that stuff. My kid might understand, but I'm at an age where I have to ask my kid for a lot of things these days. Actually, I've started to ask my grandchildren for answers to things. But in any event, this is the beginning now. We're just going to start. I'm going to go to Lens Corrections, click on both Remove Chromatic Aberration and Profile Correction. I'm going to go to the Transform tool. But you know what? This, these, these images, these look great. When, when I'll tell you a secret. When vertical elements are shown as vertical, vertical means the top is above the bottom, okay? Directly above the bottom. Uh, the horizon line, which is, you can't see it because it's hidden by all this stuff in the way, is automatically level. That's just geometry. So that's kind of cool. And um, I'm gonna, I'm, so I'm, I'm gonna leave transform as it is, I'm not gonna touch it. Now we're gonna go to the basic panel. You know what I'm gonna do first? Highlights down, shadows up. I know, looks a little, just doesn't look great yet. Just starting, okay? But look at the histogram. Look at that. It's not clipping highlights and it's not clipping shadows. Or sometimes we say blowing highlights, same as clipping. We don't usually say blow shadows, but it's clipping shadows. I'm just giving you kind of the lingo. But since there's no rules that are universally accepted, you can call it whatever you want, okay? You have my permission. If anybody complains, Give them my email address and tell them to contact me. Okay, I'm gonna skip the whites and blacks. I'm gonna to go to, actually, you know what I'm gonna do? It's such a beautiful histogram. <laughs> I'm thinking here, I'm gonna pull down on exposure. I know I said I don't usually do that. I'm gonna pull down and I wanna have a little extra space left on the highlight area because when I play with texture, boom, boom, boom. Remember I talked about the stair step? 
you have to experiment how big the treads are. You know what a tread is? It's where you put your foot down flat, okay, on a stair. When the treads are, whether the treads are deeper, wider, in other words, or, or a closer together, uh, um, almost like a ladder, okay, you decide that. In this case, I'm liking what I see. Have I done this before? Yeah, I did it before, but you'd be surprised. As you um, edit images, it's going to go faster and faster uh, with all the new images you come up with. I'm not going to touch vibrance and saturation. You know why? Because I'm going to look at saturation. Oh, now look at this. Remember how red, the, the red channel saturation didn't make any difference at all? Look what it, now it's start, starting to make a bigger difference. I'm going to do a little bit of saturation in the red channel. How about the, the green channel? Uh, yeah, I want to bring it up a little bit as well. Blue. Whoa, not too much. It's going to look, you know, crazy. I'm going to, I'm going to leave blue where it is. Actually, I'm going to pull blue back a tiny bit. I'm going to not do too much changing here. I'm going to go to the HSL panel. Just look at luminance. I don't deal with saturation here. I did. I deal with saturation in the calibration panel. I'm not going to change the hues. You can play with hue if you want to. I'm just admitting to you, I, I never play with it. Maybe I should. Uh, but uh, uh, luminance, luminance. Well, I'm going to pull it up a little bit because I like what it's doing on the chairs here. Then I'm going to take orange. I'm going to go, whoa, OK. Now, I like, I like orange because it's bringing in the sunlight. Uh, yellow. Yeah, I'm going to pull up yellow as well a little bit. Actually, a lot. Green. Uh, yeah, I'm going to leave it almost where it was. Aqua. Aqua. I don't, I don't see anything with aqua. Blue. Yeah, blue. We can eliminate the blue or, or come back. I'm going to pull it down just a touch. OK, let's see where we are. I'm going to go to the backslash key on the right-hand side. I think that's where it is on a, on a Windows machine as well. That's before. Now, this before was the merged HDR, OK? I'm going to come back. Big difference. Mega difference. OK, now I'm going to go to detail. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sharpen aggressively. I mean, OK, look, you can go from 0 to 150. Uh, if I double click on the slider, it goes back to the original, which is 40. That's what it comes in at. It's generally good at 40, but I'm going to go up to like uh, 100. And uh, you know why? Because I have my magic bullet, my masking tool. Click on the option or alt key, hold it down, keep it down. Click on with your right hand, unless you got big hands. Click on the little button here on the masking tool. Everything goes white. That means everything sharpened. Uh, we don't want that. I want to just have the edges of elements sharpened. Look at that. Look at that. That's, I can see the grain and the wood. I'm excited. Um, I'm happy. Okay, that's number two. Let's look at a third image. We're going to jump over here to this um, this marmot. This is one of yours, um, and it's, it's got a lot of like a lot, a lot of good things happening here. It's and I understand you can't get super close to these little guys. Uh, I think it's a guy. I don't know where to look if it's a girl or a boy. That's just my limitation here, living in Vancouver. I'm going to do some things differently with this one, eh? because Lightroom has some new features like, like masking, auto masking, which is really pretty nice. All the things that you can do with, with the AI tools, you could, you could always pretty much do before, um, certainly in Lightroom. Uh, but uh, it just took forever, and I'm lazy. I want. I don't expect instant gratification, but I want like close to instant. So I'm going to select the marmot. And um, it's tempting. You see, I got choices here. I can select the subject, the sky, or the background. 
if I select the subject, because I'm just going to show you, I've tried this already, it's going to select not only the marmot, but the rock it's on. I want to keep it separate. Uh, I'm not going to do that. So there's another tool here called objects, objects. And with objects, I, I've got two, two modes. I can either uh, kind of use a what you maybe know, if you know anything about Photoshop, you know, like a lasso tool. You can draw a line around something. Or you've got this box. I like the box. So I'm going to click on the box. Then I'm just going to, I'm going to zoom in here a little bit and say a little prayer. Because I find praying uh, in, in editing is like really helpful. It's my religion. Don't want to offend anybody. I'm just telling you what I'm doing. I let go. And it, ah, look at that. It selected it. So now, once I move a slider, like uh, shadows, shadows, watch this. Woo, awesome. Maybe even, dare I say it, a little bit of exposure, just a little bit, just a tiny bit of exposure. Okay, I'm happy with that. Now, there is another uh, uh, something that's really cool here. It, I'm going to I'm going to zoom I'm going to zoom out, okay? Because now I want to look at the rest of the picture, and uh, if I go on the masking area here, there's the mask, that little white thing. That's the that's the marmot. If I take these three, I don't know if it's an ampersand or just three dots. I click on it. It allows me to do different things. One of the things it can do is duplicate and invert the mask. Ha! Huh, that's what I want. Because now I'm going to have everything everything else. Now I can look at the exposure here. I am going to take the exposure down a little bit. I am going to take the highlights down a lot. I'm going to take the shadows and pull them up a bit. That's a value judgment. Um, I'm looking at the histogram here. You know, I got a little room left, but remember, I might want to play with um, with texture, uh, clarity. And dehaze, no, dehaze, look at that, Ugh. no. Uh, so no, I'm not gonna touch dehaze here. And I've, I still got room here, okay, okay. I can take, now remember, I'm on the background, so to speak. So I'm gonna take, unclick this, Now I'm looking at the whole scene, okay? So now I'm gonna uh, go back to the basic panel, and look at perhaps whites. Bring up the whites a little bit, little bit. I know I can click on the Option or Alt key and try to nail it exactly when I see see those three or five green dots at the top. That means it's overexposing. Get rid of those. Okay. Now I'm going to do one other thing on this picture. And uh, whoever the artist is, please don't get mad at me. I'm just trying to show you. This is one that that is, is really good, I want to crop it. Please don't get upset. I'm going to crop this image like this, because I want, this is such a glorious foreground and glorious background, actually, that um, I'm going to crop it. I'm going to go to full screen. Yeah, there it is. Now we've done three images. Uh, I think is this time is it time yet for a little break? Yeah, I, I think we can. We're uh, we're pretty close to halfway, according to what you said earlier so when we were I'm chatting about. It, so yeah, that's okay. So we'll take a five minute break. Uh, I will stick around here, and um, I'm going to keep my screen sharing on if that's okay. But sure. if you guys, if anybody has questions. Uh, I'll be very honest about the answers, which means I may not know the answer. I will tell you, okay? <laughs> but uh, Fair enough. don't be shy. Thank you, guys. Okay, so we're going to take a quick five. If you want to get up and stretch your legs, go grab a drink or whatever. But if you want to um, ask a question or whatever, just unmute yourself and uh, ask away. Well, I'll say something since I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. But uh, um... It, it, to to me, the toughest thing, and it, you kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, but the toughest thing is always how much is too much. And, you know, I mean, yeah, I, that's where I struggle because I don't, I've always historically been a, you know, 
off the camera and very limited editing. And, and so I struggle with making it, um, doing too much to it. You know, I mean, it, I mean, how, how, how do you know? I mean, you know, it's just gut feel or whatever, I guess. I'll tell you the answer. Well, I'll tell you Rick's answer. Okay. So, um, you talked about too much. Two is the magic word, T W O. So you, 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 you wait two days, look at it again. And then you wait two weeks and look at it again. And then you wait two months and look at it again. And that's the best way to know. And in general, um, most people, including me, kind of think, oh, maybe I went a little too far, <laughs> like a little too strong. The sky is nice and blue. It's a little bit day glow blue, if you know what I'm trying to say. And um, uh, it means that to get it kind of finalized in the first cut, that doesn't mean you can't do that, but it's not easy. Are you okay with my answer? <laughs> oh no, that's that's actually really fantastic. I'm I'm a lot of the times I take the picture, do the editing, and then that's it, and I never come back to it. So I like that. Come back in two days, two weeks, two months. I'm I'll I'll, I'll apply that for sure. Absolutely. Okay, try it. And and uh, uh, I'll tell you something. Is you had the courage to ask me a question, which I appreciate. Um, for people who listen to this, <laughs> I have a policy where if you have any questions in the future, or if you want to share any images with me and say, Rick, what do you think? Did I go too far? Did I go too little? Da, 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 da. I'm happy to uh, to respond back to you. Um, and and, and uh, I will tell you actually why I even do that. Because for me, teaching is absolutely the best way to learn. So for me, which may be surprising to some of you, this is much a learning experience for me as it is for you guys. Just trying to figure out what I'm going to do with these images and how I'm going to do it is um, uh, was a challenge, if I can say that, because they're not my images. And I don't even know what the author or the artist really wanted to do. Um, in any event, thanks for asking. Yeah, thank you for the answers. Sure. Anybody else? Yeah, Rick, this is Carl. Um, one question for you. Sure. I noticed that you're not selecting a camera profile. Is that is there a reason for that? But the reason I ask is because like I shoot a Fuji and Fuji has some wonderful camera profile, you know, film simulation, they call them profiles. Um, but I, I noticed that you're just leaving everything at like camera standard or we're not actually messing with that. Yeah. Okay, um, you bring up a very, very good question. <laughs> I always, uh, I, I realized from your question that I should have mentioned that. The most important thing I do to start with is to select a profile. And I want the flattest profile possible. If anybody can hear me, <laughs> if you would all return, please, and we can get the uh get back to this and uh, Rick, if you'll center up Lightroom in your in your screen there so we can see the whole thing. That'd be awesome. So welcome back, everybody. Um, during the intermission, we had a couple of really good questions. And one of them uh, dealt specifically with the notion of um, uh, the camera profile. Camera profiles are really just dedicated to the manufacturer. They each have different profiles. Uh, we'll just pick Canon and Sony and Nikon as examples, but we could list Fuji, we could list them all, uh, Pentax and so forth. The thing is, is that um, th th what a profile does is, is it's trying to make the picture look good. This is a little sarcastic, but it's actually true. Um, uh, when you're in a camera store buying a camera, often you'll take a test picture and you look at it and it's going to be set to look as good as possible right in the viewfinder. And of course, you're looking at a JPEG representation of the image, regardless of whether it's a raw file or not, because um, you can't, you, you, it's possible to see a raw, a raw profile. You'd have to go into your 
operating system, which I do not recommend you do, but it, I'll tell you what it is. It looks like a very muddy uh, black and white image uh, because it's not an image, okay? It's just a collection of data. In any event, a profile generally deals with uh, the color intensity, uh, the saturation, uh, well, I'll say saturation uh, and, and tone um, uh, of the image and contrast. That's those three things, okay? Now, a, a vivid profile would up the saturation a little bit, up the um, contrast uh, to try to make the picture look, oh, wow, it looks great. Um, I prefer a, a profile that is what, what's called flat. Nikon actually happens to call their flattish profile flat. Sony, I think, calls it neutral. Uh, I may be wrong on the not nomenclature, um, but the idea is, 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 is a profile is actually a curve. It's a tone curve, okay? And a flat tone curve would just be a straight line. Now, no camera manufacturer so far, and, and I'm talking now about, I'm not gonna go into, uh, into uh, large, uh, Oh, uh, camera sensors. Talking about 35 millimeter size sensor, you know, what they call full frame and smaller. Uh, none of them, to my knowledge, will give you a profile that has no curve at all, just straight, okay? Uh, why do they don't do that? I don't know, because that's what we're aiming for. There is a way to achieve that. That is beyond the scope of this presentation. And here's an example. This is a penguin. I think it's an Adelie penguin. I'm not a penguin expert, but uh, I'm guessing it's a penguin. This is the opposite of the marmot. This is like zoomed in. Well, the marmot is kind of like, you know, I'll, I'll say wide angle, whatever term to use. And if I take this image and I change the profile from color, well, first of all, whatever uh, profile you set in your camera, it won't matter. It's going to come into Lightroom as a as a color. It's going to say color. If you're using another program, it might make a difference. But if you're using Lightroom, it will always come in as color. So, but I can go here and I can I can go to this is actually 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 you know what they had set this as vivid. Okay, vivid. So I'm going to go back admitting that I, I, I neglected this, I'm gonna go back to flat. Now watch the difference in the penguin's face. Three, two, one. Can you see how much more detail you can see now? I'm not saying it's the finished. I'm just saying it's dumbing it down. Look at the histogram. We're gonna just look at the histogram. We're gonna to go to profile, camera flat. We're gonna go back to vivid. Well, there's Adobe Vivid. I'm going to go to Camera Vivid 321. See how it widened it out? I want to squish the histogram. That's uh, that's a term that nobody knows except me. I want to compress. That's a better term. I want to compress the histogram as much as possible. Why? Because I want to have as much flexibility in the shadows and in the highlights to play with the image. I should have said that up front. I didn't say that. Now I'm saying it. <laughs> uh, okay. So I'm gonna go back here to Camera Vivid. And just so you know, there's, you look at the history, well, there's standard. Whoa, look at the difference in the histogram. There's portrait, there's neutral, there's landscape, which is gonna push it out again. It's almost like vivid. And then there's flat. So if it's a Nikon file, I'm always gonna use flat. If it's a different file, I'm gonna to try to find the one that compresses the histogram left to right as much as possible to give me the most flexibility as editing. I'm not doing it because it looks better. I'm doing it because I have more ability to get data and I can see more detail, even though it's kind of muddy right now. Okay, how am I gonna start with this one? I'm gonna to go, to, to go to lens correction. 
I'm going to go click, click. No change here. Now I'm going to go to transform. I'm going to click. Uh, no, there's nothing to transform here. If, in my opinion, I can't tell if the penguin's tipping over or not. That's the whole picture. There is the whole picture. Okay, so now I'm going to go to the basic panel. Well, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go up up here to Rick. Yeah. Uh, didn't you want to go back to flat to show how you develop from? Oh, flat? you're right. You're right. Thank you. You have to travel with me, okay, so that you can help me get through these presentations. That would be awesome. Okay. So now, thank you. I'm back. <laughs> And I'm going to go to subject. Look at that. That's just to have one click. Even the 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 hairs on 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 the head. Like I mean, this is pretty good. This is um. This is where AI, in my opinion, is is working very well. There are. I don't say that about all aspects. I was telling Terry before the before I started, that I have a new presentation on the impacts of AI in photography, okay? The good, the bad, and the ugly, because uh, there are some ugly and bad impacts, uh, not only in arc, not only in photography, but globally. That's another story. Point is, this is one great thing. So I've done that. So now I can go here and I can play with, uh, let's bring down the highlights. Let's bring up the shadows. Uh, let's let's uh, look at gonna ooh, look how much room I still have for blacks and whites. Good to know. I'm gonna skip down though to you know what it's gonna be texture. Oh yeah, texture, clarity, dehaze. Yeah, that's looking good. That's looking good. I've got a little bit left on the right. I'm gonna use it for whites just to fill out this thing for now. Oop, too much, too much. Come on back. Come on back. I talked to my program. I don't have a dog, but I don't have to walk this one. So that's nice. Um, let's just leave it there for now. We'll come back. Just for now, we're going to stay with this. I'm going to go to those three dots and I'm going to say duplicate and invert the mask so I can play with the background and I want to lower the exposure in the background. I may even want to just for fun, um, uh, lower the texture even more, maybe even lower the clarity. Uh, probably not the dehaze, no, 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 no. If anything, I'm gonna pull up the dehaze a little bit. And um, there's my, there's, that's the whole picture, but I'm gonna keep going because I wanna do, um, oh, I'm out of this, I'm gonna get out of this. So let me think out loud. Yeah, because I wanna, I wanna look at, Calibration, real fast. Yeah, I'm going to pull up cal saturation a little bit. He's got a dirty tummy, but that's part of the penguin. That's uh, I've been to Antarctica, and there's a reason why they look like that. <laughs> and there's a reason why they make you wear rain pants in the biggest desert in the world. Because when you get down low to photograph a penguin, you have lots of penguin poop on you. And that's what part of this is. But that's part of the species. So then we're going to go to HSL, and I'm going to look at the orange. Hmm. And I'm going to look at yellow. Very slight changes here. I'm going to leave the rest like they are. Orange. I'm going to go up a little further on orange because I forgot his bill. You see his bill? I want to see that orange specks over here. Okay. So now I'm going to go. Oh, do detail, sharpening, masking, just the penguin, just his fur, click. Now, I could come back to the basic panel, and I'm going to pull down the blacks. I want to get a little more punch, and I'm going to even, you know, flip some of that. One more thing I'm going to do, one more thing I'm going to do, I'm going to take the the uh, the um, masking tool. I'm going to go down to a new mask, and I'm going to click on the brush, and I'm going to just put this on his eye, and I'm going to 
come down here and try to pull up the exposure on the eye a little bit. Not the iris, but the, the frame of the eye. And I'm going to try something. I'm going to go to temperature and give him a little bit more blue around the edge of his eye. OK. It could be another color if you want. I'm just saying you get the idea what I'm doing. Cut that off. And um, now I'm going to take this into Photoshop. I know I said I'd use Lightroom, but I'm too tempted to show you something. Photoshop has a beta now, maybe you know, and I've been using it, which is, I do not advise people to try beta software, but I'm using it because it's a separate package, but it's creating havoc with how I transfer from Lightroom and back and forth. But I want to show you something. Come up here, reduce the size. Okay, this is something new, generative fill. We're going to try. This is experiment, experiment, because I'm hoping you're having a good time. I want to have a good time. I'm going to try to add to this picture. All I'm going to do, I'm not going to put any text prompt in. I'm just going to click generate. And what it's going to do is going to give me three different options of how to fill in the rest of the image. So you can see the bar here moving to the right. It takes a little bit of time. Uh, and it stalls on purpose because it knows I'm wanting it to go fast, but that's the relationship I have. It gives you three images. Here's one. Here's another. Here's another. Come on. Whoa, that one's, you know what? I like this one. Um, I like the color of his toes. If you don't like that, you can click generate again. And it'll give you three more. Now, you can you can go as as there's there's really there is an ultimate. I don't think you can get more than like sixty four images, but I mean there's tons, right? So that's not a problem. I actually think I like of all the choices was was this guy here. So I'm gonna save him. I could remove some stuff in this picture. I could play with it, but that's not the purpose of this, this, this thing. We could put a little vignette on the picture, all that stuff. I'm trying to show you some of the interesting things that are happening. Is that still a photo? Ha! Huh. To me, it's, uh, it's mixed media. Because for me, a photograph is uh, where you are recording light on light sensitive material, like film or like a digital sensor. So this is the controversy. And um, I kind of deal with that a bit in my talk if you ever want me to come back. So I'm going to leave that there at that for now. I'm going to, here is a beautiful lady in a gorgeous forest. I want to show you a people person, a people person, a people, a person photo, right? A human. What are we going to do with this? Well, I'm going to zoom in. Because I want to start initially looking at taking advantage again of some of the new features in Lightroom that uh, uh, are dealing with masking. Okay. I have some interesting options here. Not only can I select a subject, but you see people down here is detecting a person. I can see the whole person. Look at that. Look at how it defines even her clothing, her hands, her head, and her hat. Okay. Now I can choose within that facial skin, body skin. I'm going to skip eyebrows because they're behind her, the rim of her glasses. Uh, eye sclera, which is the white, which is actually the, the, the uh, white part of her eyes. Iris and pupil and uh, lips and hair and clothes. Whoa, whoa, that's a lot of stuff. But let's go through it quickly because I can just to show you the power of, of what you can do now. And look at look at the histogram. I mean, this is already, I haven't done anything and the histogram looks fantastic. Okay, what, why is it fantastic? Because it's, all the data is there. I'm not losing any highlights. I'm not losing any shadows, it's great. Okay, uh, let's get started. 
So how am I going to do that? I'm going to click on her facial skin. There it is. Whoops. No, come on. Oh, I know what I forgot. Forgot. I gotta, I've got to click these guys and then I've got to click create mask. That's important. Create the mask. So I'm going to start here. I'm going to start at the bottom. And uh, facial skin, it at least told me finally what, they, what it is, facial skin. And I'm going to go to, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take exposure and pull it up just a little bit, just to brighten it up a little bit. And I'm going to then go down to texture. Uh, ladies would like it generally. This is not a sexist comment, okay? Just pull down the texture a little bit. Still want to see a, a few wrinkles. You know, I don't want it to look plastic. I don't want it to look plastic. Just pull down a little bit, call it a day. I could I could play with for, for a long time with this. We're not going to do that. We're just going to go, we did that. We're going to look at her neck. That's her, that's her facial skin. I mean, her, her rest of her skin. We're going to do, in this case, exposure. I want to keep it. She's in the, it's in the shadow. So I brought it up like 0.04, almost nothing. But I am going to help her skin by going to the texture again. Pull that back a little bit. Okay. Next, I'm going to go to her lips. And uh, <clears throat> her lips are pretty, pretty out there right now. But uh, I'm going to pull up exposure a little bit. They're just pretty bright. I actually want to. I can pull up the highlights as well a little bit. I want to shadows. Pull up the shadows a bit. Just don't want her, don't want her lips to be so bright. I mean, that's just me, right? Then I'm going to leave it. Then I'm going to go to mask four, which is iris and pupil. There's her iris. You know what I'm going to do on this one? I'm going to take the exposure. That's too bright. Huh? So, <laughs> I hope she's not in the audience. So, okay, so we're going to just pull it up a little bit. And I'm also going to actually use saturation. I'm going to pull up saturation a little bit. And then I'm going to go to sharpen the eyes a little bit. Then I'm going to go to hair. Let's do hair. Uh, well, okay, believe it or not, on hair, what I'm going to do is just put a little bit of magenta in her hair. Why? Because I want to kind of blend a little bit better with her scarf. It's just, just an idea, having fun. Okay, I think we did almost everything. Oh, clothing. Yeah, well, clothing, you know what? Hmm. I think I want to uh, have more texture in her clothing, and I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it at that. I missed one. I want her sclera. There it is. There it is. Now, I'm gonna just make it a tiny bit whiter, like not too much, a little bit more white. Okay, maybe a little bit of exposure, just a, just a bit, like. Like that's freaky. I'm not going to do that. Don't worry. But my point is, you know, it's okay to go take the sliders all the way. It looks like she's been in a fight there. I'm going to just bring it up a little bit so it's a little more bright on the eyes and call it a day. Go back. Okay. Now, just just for fun, we go here before, after. You may say it's not a big difference. Is, is the difference. Oops, no, got to go this way. Cut that off. Go before, after, before, after. Okay. Now, I want to, you know what I'm going to do. I'm, I've got, uh, I'm going to go back to the mask. We are getting nothing. It's freezing up on me. What I wanted to do is to take the background and make it a little darker, but but bring out a little more detail. See, here the dilemma is this log that she's next to is just glorious. But I but 
she is the primary objective here, right? She's the, she's the, the, the main subject, primary interest. For me, the subject of a photograph is the entire field of view edge to edge. But there's a primary area of interest, secondary area of interest, and tertiary, and so forth. The lady is the primary area. So I'm, I'm happy with her right now. I want to, I have a practice one here. So I'm going to open that in Photoshop. I am going to show you something that you can do. How could we improve this picture? Just forget about the editing of the colors and stuff for a moment. I want to show you some things that you can do now with generative fill. So I take this lasso tool. You see this, I don't, what should I call this? A stump? I don't know what to call it. But um, to me, it's, it's blocking her. And I would rather just select this in general and then click on generative fill, generate, and see if it will remove remove it. And uh, whoa, okay, that's the first one. Second one, third one. Well, I like either the second one. Or I like the second one. I can see a little bit of her jacket. I see her now. I see her other leg. Let me be bold. I'm gonna to try to see if I can remove this part of her purse that's sticking out here. And uh, <laughs> I'm gonna get more aggressive. Oh, I can't, I can't. Okay, I'm gonna select this. And try something. Actually, let's not be too crazy. I'm going to select that and I'm going to click on generative fill, generate. Look at that. Look at that. One thing that I wish, I wish, I wish her sleeve was not quite so puffy there. Generative fill. So no text prompts. Um, I'm trying to just pull in her puffy sleeve. Now, I know there's other tools in Photoshop. I'm trying to show you the, the new tools, OK? I violated the user guidelines. So I can see there's a police car outside now. I might be in big trouble. Well, OK, I won't do that. But what could we do with this image? I'm going to consider cropping it. I'm going to consider just cropping it like this. This stuff in the upper left and upper and lower left doesn't excite me. And there's the picture. I can move this away and I can make it full screen. Come on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So that is the, uh, that's the photo. And what I'm trying to say is, uh, First of all, it's a great photo. Um, all, all three of the photos that Terry sent me are, are super. Um, but um, that's the, you know you can see where if you had more time, you could really play around with this stuff. So I'm going to take the few minutes that I have left, and I'm going to go back, and I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to talk about Terry wanted to. I have to tell you guys something. Terry really pushes hard to satisfy you guys. <laughs> I um, I wanted two hours to do this, okay, which is fine. I'm down from that. That's okay. But he wanted me to also talk about black and white. I have a separate presentation just on black and white because it's a, it's a it's a fascinating topic. But I'm going to touch on it for you, give you a taste, and uh, show you what I would do to edit a black and white image. Here we go. This is a scene in Cuba. It's the, it's the palace of the generals. This is how the generals used to live uh, when the people were just sadly uh, starving in the streets, okay? Um, in any event, now it's a tourist attraction. So I went here. I was uh, in, early in the morning and um, uh, Nobody else was there, which was great. And I made this, this uh, photo. But 
as this is again a, a high dynamic range of light because I use two photos. The one on the upper left is three stops above uh, the metered exposure. The one on the right is one stop below. But look at the, the lower histogram. You'll see that it's not, um, it, it's as bright as possible. This picture down here on the lower right is as bright as possible without exposing, overexposing anything. I'm not clipping any highlights. And the one above is so much brighter than the first that, um, yeah, I'm clipping a tiny bit of, of shadow up here, but eh, both pictures are lousy. That's my point. But I put them together in Lightroom, doing the same thing I already did, all right? Merge to HDR, and that's what I got. Now, let me tell you about uh, black and white. What I do is I first edit it in color. I know there are sensors that you can get. They're very expensive, uh, but that's fine. Let's assume you can afford it. Uh, it'll give you a black and white picture. Pretty good. The advantage of a color sensor is that since there's luminance and color, the more colors, the more shades, the more uh, saturation and hue variation allows you to be more selective with how you play with color, how you play with black and white. Black and white is pure luminance, okay? Every color has some luminance. I, you could tell when I was going through the luminance uh, uh, um, examples uh, with uh, the HSL tool in, in either uh, Lightroom or frankly in Photoshop, um, you could see the differences. Well, that can be to your advantage. This is designed as a color image. When I play with it in Lightroom, taking, actually, I don't have the, the original image I used for this, but I actually overdid the saturation a tiny bit. I made it a little too colorful for color. But for black and white, I was able to change it. Now, I first want to tell you that we see depth in luminance. We see depth in luminance alone. We do not see depth in color. This is pure color. This is the original color picture that I edited. This is only showing the color with no luminance. Um, and you get very little of any sense of depth because actually, biologically, we do not see depth in color. However, we see depth in luminance. And pure luminance gives us a maximum sense of depth. So to cut to the chase here, instead of an hour and a half, I can tell you that the best black and white images are the ones that enhance the sense of depth. Obviously, there's other reasons that you may want black and white. But that's the magic of black and white, when it can enhance the sense of depth. Well, I'm never satisfied. So I've been playing with taking the, a, a, a color image and overlaying the black and white version of it on top, and then changing the opacity of the black and white image to maintain color, but increase the amount of luminance in the color. And, and um, that's pure black and white. That's now reducing the opacity of a colored overlay. I, I think I said it wrong. The color is on top, reduce the opacity of the color until I still have color, but now I have more luminance. I, I got to show you the difference between. So I'm going to have a kind of an A and B. The picture on the left is pure color. The picture on the right is enhancing the luminance in color. So this is a little more advanced, but you know, it's very simple to do. Um, I didn't even use Photoshop. I just used, you can do it in Keynote or you can do it in, in PowerPoint, okay? Just have, a, have one picture on top of another, 
and just lower the opacity of the other one. Well, I lowered the opacity by 50%. So here's the difference. Look at the texture on the ground. Um, look at the texture on the ground. You can see more texture on the right. You may like the one on the left better. That's okay. That's not the purpose. The purpose is look at the column on the right. Look how much more texture there is in that column. Look at the look at the the uh, the uh, wall on the left part of each picture. So you can see, like I said, you might not like what I'm playing with, but my pitch to you, since there are no universally accepted rules of anything in photography, which is my opening statement, it's okay to play. Eh? Play is not just for kids. Play is research. Play is experimentation. This is one example of an experiment that I feel comfortable enough to at least show you um, as a legitimate uh, possibility. That's the black and white. So guys, one little pitch at the end. I love giving presentations. Usually they go more smoothly because I, I, it's, all, it's all done. I'm not trying to solve it in front of you, but that's okay. Um, waterfront cityscape photography, the joy of symmetry in photography, uh, you can read. Um, I, uh, I showed you the one the last time I was there, I talked about architectural photography, but I have urban street photography, the lure of luminance, which is black and white, complexity, contradiction, and confusion over color. It's a whole separate presentation. Then kind of travel photography. Antarctica, Portugal, Czech Republic, um, uh, Havana, Cuba. And my latest one, as I mentioned, is artificial intelligence and photography, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So um, I'm stealing the uh, title of a Clint Eastwood movie back in 1966. And most of you are much, much younger, probably won't even know that, but who knows, there might be a few of you remember that movie. But um, Thank you all very much for listening. I'm going to now stop sharing, and we'll see if we have a few minutes left for some questions or comments or pushback. I'm uh, I'm here to learn as well. Now I'm going to get back to my screen, Zoom, stop sharing, and see if anybody's still here. Oh, there's a few people here, which is good. You know, I don't see you guys when I'm doing my thing, and I'm wondering sometimes, is anybody there? So thank you all very much for your patience. Any any questions? We're getting a couple of comments in the chat there. Everybody thinks it's thank fantastic. You. Thank you guys. I appreciate I, them. I have to say that, you know, thank you for ruining my tomorrow. I will <laughs> not get any work done because I'm going to be playing around with that <laughs> color black and white overlay kind of thing. That is super okay. cool. Oh, thank you. Thank you very That's much. Awesome. I appreciate it. No, the results are just fantastic on that. It's, it's nothing I've ever thought about, and I don't think I've ever even seen a video about it. But, but. I haven't either. I haven't either. But I learned about the notion of depth from a, a book on biology. So I've been studying uh, uh, everything that I was asleep for in school. Yeah. That's <laughs> but um, I, uh, I find that if I can learn from the sciences and apply them to the arts, I can just be, you know, I'm having fun and I, I don't pretend otherwise. Rick, um, have you played with the denoise function in Lightroom that was just added a little while ago? I, I know you, you strongly suggest uh, shooting at the native ISO, but sure. uh, for you know, rapid movements, obviously capturing that, you, want, you may want to push it to the stratospheric uh, ISOs and yeah. get all that good noise. <laughs> I, I have not played with denoise in Lightroom. I've been using uh, Topaz denoise um, or Topaz AI, which uh, I find fantastic for denoising. But I will tell you that my friends who are teachers also uh, have been really testing out Lightroom and they think it's fantastic. They think it's, you know, it's on a par with what Topaz is doing, maybe even a little bit better but I have not personally tried it, but definitely it's worthwhile. If you use Lightroom, you should get to know uh, the, the denoise function. Uh, I admit I have not had the chance to do that yet. Thanks. This was great, great material that you covered, so I really appreciate it. 
Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. I'm sorry I didn't go super smoothly, but but you know what? That's kind of real life. Uh, that's what happens. So that's the only way I can justify it. There was sorry, another, somebody in the room had something. Yeah, somebody was talking. I don't know if it was um, Cecilia or, or Marilyn. Somebody was sounded like a lady, maybe Laura. It's okay. So I'm serious about staying in touch. If you'd like, no obligation. Well, we very much appreciate that. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, some of us are suffering from sensory overload. Um, I'm glad that uh, I'll be able to go back and look at the recording on this. Very much appreciate uh, everything that you put into this and, and accommodating our little touch about black and white. I appreciate that. Does anybody else have any questions? Super helpful, Rick. Super, super helpful. Oh, thanks, David. At least it says David. I think I'm looking at the. That was Kyle. Was that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of Davids there, but that's okay. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh... Yeah, Rick. This this is Andy Robbins. I'll probably be reaching out because, you know, I am a novice at editing and doing spending hours and hours and hours editing and feeling that it's just kind of rote okay. at this point. And I kind of feel like I'm in the same kind of rut of just apply this, apply this, apply this, apply this, which I don't want to be in. Okay. And I've been shooting a lot of scenes with natural light or lack of light, which mm -hmm. puts my ISOs really high. Like I did a sporting event this weekend in the dark. It was a cycling event. Wow. wow. Nine o'clock at night. And so I had to have high shutter speeds, sure. uh, which meant I also had to have high ISO. <laughs> you know? sure, no, I understand that's real. That's real. I used to do sports. I don't move as fast as I used to be able to. There's a lot. Of, what can I say? Yeah. Uh, my, my gear has gotten heavier and my pants have shrunk. I, I, I don't know what's wrong. Something's, something's <laughs> wrong. But using topaz and and trying not to do over this overdo the skin tones i've found to be a problem so i might reach out and see what sure well you know what send me uh send me a couple of images or something or a couple of files and and we can maybe have a zoom together or, or you know yeah and and i like the content about not touching exposure if you don't have to uh, mm -hmm. i think that was really you know work with some of the other sliders to bring those you know, bring those contrasts out. So I like that. Thank you. Okay, great. Oh, thank you. Super. I think Andy made, made a good point there. A lot of us who have been shooting for a long time or using Lightroom since version two, like I have. Um, yeah, we do get stuck in a rut. We do have that that same kind of, okay, I got an image up. I'm going to go to this and this. I'm going to touch this slider and add some clarity. I'm going to do this and that and that. And uh, what you've shown us tonight is just that said just play around don't be afraid to rack it all the way to the left all the way to the right you know see see what you like uh, it doesn't have to be so you know robotic it can be just free and organic sure well if no one else has anything for rick uh, i think we uh, shall say good night all and hey. uh, rick we appreciate you very much uh, appreciate the information you provided us and for graciously uh, being available to us after the fact. We, we do appreciate that. Okay. We appreciate that a lot. So, guys, have a good evening. You too. And uh, we'll, we'll stay in touch. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. We, may, we, may, we may see you next year for an AI presentation. Sure, that'd be great. Okay. I think it'd be fantastic. All right. Okay, super. Okay. Bye-bye Thank now. you, everyone. Good night. Bye, Rex.